1989, Adobe released the first version of Photoshop, and over the last three and a half decades, Photoshop has become the undisputed industry titan for photo editing. But when I look at Photoshop today, compared to Photoshop from the late 90s, we see a lot of similarities. Most Photoshop features that users need are included in the 1999 version, Photoshop 5.5. In this video, I'm exploring the old version of Photoshop to prove just how capable it is, and why this 30-year-old software does everything you need. I'm Alex, and this is Retro Tech Dreams. All right, to get started, I'm on my Windows 98 machine. I'm gonna open up Photoshop 5.5 right here on my desktop. So Photoshop's interface in 5.5 is very similar to the Photoshop we have today. The color picker is identical 25 years later. Photoshop 5.5 even supports HTML color codes. The canvas size window is exactly the same today too, even down to the way that we select the anchor points of the images. Color correction tools like levels are exactly the same, even down to using similar icons for setting the black and white points. Filters are largely unchanged. Gaussian blur looks like it hasn't been touched in decades. Radio blur has the same visualization for previewing its effect. And can you believe the lens flare filter is still included in modern versions of Photoshop? When was the last time you've seen a lens flare used in any modern design? The clone tool works to remove objects from photos. Photoshop 5.5 has full support for layers, blending options, and channel separation. It even supports programmable actions and sophisticated bulk actions. All of these features are sitting in this single desktop application that is nearly three decades old. Photoshop today is the industry standard for photo editing, but I'd argue that Photoshop from 1999 has more production-ready features than most alternative options available today. Even the preview application built into Mac OS has extremely limited color correction options compared to Photoshop 5. Give me Mac OS preview for the convenience, but give me Photoshop 5 for the features. Now that we've seen a bit of what Photoshop 5 is capable of, let's create something new. A really common use case in image editing apps is removing backgrounds from photos. I have this image of a lion I found on Unsplash. A lot of image editing apps today offer support for removing backgrounds, but many would not deliver the necessary level of quality for production environments. Photoshop 5.5 can, so let me show you how to do this. So while I can come over here and use the lasso tool to try to select this, my freehand skills are not very good, and we're definitely not going to get the transparency that we need around the fur. Instead, what we can do is we can use channels to let Photoshop attempt to select the subject for us. Next to layers, we have channels. Channels separate colors into different layers so that we can manipulate them. What I'm going to look for is the channel that has the highest amount of contrast between our subject and the background. And it looks like the red channel is the best one to use. So what I'm going to do is actually grab the red channel and just drag it onto the new channel icon to make a copy of this. Now this gives us a new channel. And what we can do is we go to image, adjust levels, and play with the brightness and contrast ourselves. So what I'm going to do is try to make the entire lion white and then make the entire background black. We're not gonna get it perfect, but we're gonna get really close with a couple adjustments. To start, I'm gonna pull in the brighter sides of the image to make this area whiter, and then I'm gonna pull in the darker parts of the image to make the background darker. Any part that's gray or not pure white or pure black, that's gonna give us the transparency that we're looking for for the fur. I'll click OK, and then using the paintbrush, what I'm gonna do is go through around here and just fill in some of these areas to make the background much darker. Next, I'll do the white area. And it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be close enough. I'm also gonna come in and fill in the nose. Even though it's a black part of the image, we want that included in the subject. Okay, and you could probably do a better job than I did, but that's generally what it looks like. Now it's really clear, this is the subject in white and we have the background in black. So I'm gonna come back here and click this button that says load channel selection, and we'll see it selected again. Go back to layers, click on our background, and then hit the add layer mask button. And I can see this gave a really nice silhouette of the line without any of the leaves in the background. I'm gonna zoom in and you can see just how much detail we're able to retain in the fur and all of the different transparency that we were able to include. And then I have turn off the black background. You can actually see what this looks like with transparency. And so now with the line cut out, I can pull in a different background or I can go to file, save for web and save this as a PNG image. Even Photoshop 5 had support for PNG files. So why go through the effort of doing this manually? My phone can select objects from photos, and the result is usually close enough for us to use. But we don't have a way to fine-tune the selection, and it wouldn't be acceptable in a production environment to use this type of result. When you do it manually, you get a much better result than by doing it automatically, and it isn't that much effort to get to this point. All right, let's do another one. I'm gonna recreate the retro grid I made for my videos. First, you may have not noticed it, but I use a star field background in the animation. So let's create the star field. I'm gonna go to filter, noise, and add noise. What I'm creating here is something to give me stars on the background. So right now it looks like a white background with black dots. We're gonna flip that in the next step. Next, what I'm gonna do is flip these colors around. So let me go to image, adjust, and invert. So instead of having a white background with black dots, we have a black background with white dots. 
Now to really make this look more like a star field, I'm going to play with the brightness and contrast. First, what I'm going to do is pull up the contrast to make the stars much brighter. And then I'm going to pull down the brightness to make the background much, much darker. And now you can see we have a star field. Next, let's bring in our grid. Before this video, I created a simple grid. This is kind of hard to see right now because this is transparent, but let me add a background color to this so you can see what this looks like. You can see this is just a simple white grid on a transparent background. What I'm going to do is click on layer one, select everything and copy this. Then I'm going to bring it over to my star field and paste it on top where it pastes a new layer. If we see lines missing, that's just because of the resolution on my monitor is much lower on these older machines, but it's all there if we zoom in. We'll see these things uh, populate. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is apply a perspective. So to do that, I'm gonna go to the edit menu, go to transform and select perspective. Then I'm gonna grab the top corner and pull these in. Already Photoshop gives a preview of what this is gonna look like. I'm just gonna hit enter and have it apply. So right now the grid is white, but I wanna actually have this be more of an orange color with a pink glow. Luckily Photoshop makes that really simple. What I can do is right click on the layer and choose effects and it gives me an option of different effects that i can use i'm gonna turn off drop shadow and it said come down here to color fill i'm gonna turn on color fill and we can see it already previewed with the red color it has selected i'm gonna open this up and type in a color that i selected before and then in here i can also go over here to outer glow so i'm gonna open this up and apply a pink glow to the orange grid next thing i'm gonna do is if you look at my animation i have the grid and actually recede into the horizon so to do that we can use something called a layer mask so if i come over here to the gradient icon i can click this i'm gonna start at the top drag a line down holding shift and let go okay and the last thing i'm going to do is create a layer underneath and create a purple gradient underneath the grid so to do that i'm going to click on the foreground color and type in a purple color that i want to use click on the gradient again and go up to the options panel and instead of choosing foreground to background, I'm gonna choose foreground to transparent. Now I'm gonna start at the bottom, click, and hold the shift key while I drag out. And we get our purple gradients. I think the angle of this grid can be better. So a really easy way to do this is just use free transform. I'm gonna select the layer, go to free transform, and just pull this down. I think that looks better. When I save this file, it saves as a PSD, a Photoshop document. New versions of Photoshop can open PSDs in any version of Photoshop, including the layers and image styles. When Photoshop 5.5 was released in 1999, it cost $600. That's $1,118 in 2024. After Adobe Creative Suite 6 in 2012, Adobe switched to a subscription model and Photoshop cost just $20 per month. Photoshop 5 was expensive, but you paid a one-time cost and owned it in perpetuity. Photoshop Creative Cloud is significantly cheaper, but your license ends when you cancel the subscription. For many people, they want the ability to choose between a lower price and a one-time cost instead of having the company choose for them. I think that's why we see high demand for alternatives like Affinity Photo, which has a one-time payment of $49, and GIMP, which is open source. If Photoshop pricing kept up with inflation and I bought a copy at the full price today, it would take me more than four and a half years to break even with a monthly subscription. Even if the price remained unchanged from 1999, it would still take me two and a half years to break even. We've largely seen software companies move to subscription models, integrating cloud storage where we have to keep paying an annual fee for the same software. But Photoshop has continued to deliver new cutting edge features we haven't seen in cheaper alternatives. So what I used Photoshop from 1999 and 2024, users on the Adobe Community Forums run Photoshop on modern versions of Windows using compatibility mode, so it can still be a powerful image editor today. But it's missing all of the really helpful and new AI features. Features like auto subject selection or content aware scale. When I'm adjusting an image, these AI features are really useful. Photoshop 5.5 shows us that even if you have an older version of Photoshop, you can still use it for image editing today. And in many cases, it'll outperform other image editing tools that we have access to. I think Photoshop shows that often the tools we have are more than enough for what we need. So so don't worry about the latest software and instead focus on creating something new. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and I'll see you in the next one.